Okay, so welcome everybody to the, what is this, the fourth episode, I think, of Maxwell TV. And with us today we have Matthew Terry, which is going to, he's going to show us, you know, how to develop our eyes and making compelling images and not just move around sliders and talk about technical, boring rendering stuff like we usually do. Um, so first of all, I'm going to go through some basic post-production steps you could do in Photoshop. And hopefully also I'll teach you a, a nice trick you can do with um, with linked images in Photoshop with the smart objects so that you can keep the 32-bit uh, functionality inside of Photoshop while still being able to use all the tools uh, in Photoshop, which many of them don't work in 32-bit mode. Okay, um, so here is a render, sort of like a test I did recently of a bathroom type render, and it's only using two emitters. So it's using some small uh, ceiling emitters, and you can see that usually with small emitters and caustics, you might have more noise, especially here since we're seeing those caustics through glass, and we know that's a problem. A little bit of noise here. You can see in contrast with the larger emitter. So this is just an emitter that's uh, as big as the entrance to the bathroom, sort of like a to mimic a big softbox. And you can see that from this emitter, it's not it's not producing the same amount of noise. So usually big emitters they don't make sharp caustics, and so you have a little bit less noise from these big emitters. Just something to be aware of. All right, so what I usually tell people is, you know, you always have to do a little bit of post-production from your renders because it's like when you take a photo and you have your, your raw photo, you still need to do some adjustments, especially in terms of contrast, to add some contrast, because you can see here by default, Maxwell gives you a sort of a linear response, a linear tone response, and you have to add a little bit of contrast to your renders. And I'm going to show you how to do that uh, in uh, in lab mode instead of RGB mode in Photoshop. I'm show you the the differences uh, that can make. Uh, so the things I usually do first of all in Maxwell before I get to Photoshop is the the uh, color temperature. So try to have as neutral tint as possible. And you can check with the cursor here if you look at the bottom right you can see the RGB readout and by the way if you click here on the RGB you can also see the readout in the hue saturation value if you prefer that and you can also see it in 16 bit or 32 bit All right so you can check a little bit if the white balance is okay so here I'm missing a little bit of blue so I can increase the temperature a little bit. And that's pretty OK, I guess. And uh, if you want to add blue or subtract, uh, add green, uh, then you move the tin slider to the left or add magenta. You can add it to the, move it to the right. But in this case, the, the white balance is already pretty okay because I use the uh, I use the default emitter uh, temperature of 6,500K, I think. Okay. And then I usually also add sharpness. I set it to 100% to make the image as, as sharp as possible and also take advantage of Maxwell's really nice anti-aliasing which still works uh, pretty well even if you set the sharpness to 100. It makes the Im image that much more uh, photographic really uh, looking sharp and nice and sometimes I lower the burn maybe 0 0.6 so in this case I'm working with pretty dark materials and also this very white porcelain material so in that case, I might actually lower the burn a little bit to avoid these uh, these uh, completely burned out areas here on the porcelain. So you can see if I leave it at the default 0 0.8, it gets a little bit too hot here. 
and I still want the rest to look uh, to look pretty lit up. So it's okay to to lower the burn a little bit. You can see that fixes the these areas a little better. Um, avoid going to you know like 0 0.2 or 0 0.1 because then things start looking fake a little bit if you lose the highlights completely. So I usually don't go any lower than about 0 0.4 or 0 0.3, something like that. In this case, maybe 0 0.6. Uh, that's going to be OK. Um, I guess D vignetting, you can add that. Because I use the pretty wide angle lens, so it darkened the edges quite a lot. <clears throat> OK. And usually that's pretty much it. That's what I do in um, in uh, Maxwell. Let me see here. Go to women webinars. Tell me something. Hello, Matthew. Hello, Matthew. Can you hear me? Yes. Now I can. Yeah, I think the connection dropped a little bit. Yeah, it seems to be back now. OK, sorry about that. I think my uh, internet connection dropped there for a second. But I think I'm back now. All right, so then. Um, I don't usually do much more than this in uh, in Maxwell, except maybe I can check the different risk response curves here. For example, I like this one, the Aqua Color Futura 100. It's pretty nice. And if it makes, if it changes, I mean, these uh, response curves usually change also the white balance a little bit. Now it turned a little bit uh, greener, so you can compensate that by changing the tint a little bit. Also, maybe the uh, color temperature. OK. Uh, but in this case, I'm going to leave it at Maxwell default. So you can see better what you can do in uh, just in Photoshop. OK. And once I have these as I want, I can go ahead and save a file. And I'm going to save it as uh, a PSD file in 32-bit, and I'm going to check here, save all channels and embed the channels if the format supports it, because I also had a, a material uh, channel here. All right, so that's going to give me a 32-bit file directly in Photoshop, so we no longer have to go through EXR unless you want to. Or you can go just to uh, Photoshop directly, especially when you're working with stills. Okay, so here is our file in Photoshop. This is the the material ID file and the main emitter, the ceiling emitter, and the main render. So it's blown out now because it's also set. So when you save it with Max on a, in a 32-bit Photoshop file, it's nice that it automatically sets the blending mode to linear dodge here. So you need to set it to linear dodge or add mode when you work in 32-bit mode. In that case, you're going to get the exact same result as you see in the in the Maxwell viewport, except that for the last layer, you should set it at normal. Otherwise, it's going to add it on top of the main render. So that's why you see like a almost like a, a doubling of the the exposure. Okay, so this looks exactly like my viewport in uh, 
in Maxwell now and have full 32-bit uh, well capability so I can change the exposure as I want so I'm gonna add a exposure adjustment layer I'm gonna hold alt and click here in the middle so it only affects the layer underneath and do the same here okay and here now I can change the exposure of this layer just as I could in uh, in the Maxwell UI okay I can also hold out alt here and just solo this emitter to see what that looks like with this one okay and now you can see that while I'm in 32-bit there's not a lot of things you can do here I mean for example curves are not available uh, a lot of the filters are not available I mean it's gotten better with uh, with newer versions in Photoshop but there's still a lot of things you can't do in 32-bit mode and also maybe you shouldn't do them because uh, some adjustments uh, are going to behave in a, in a weird way also a few of the blending modes most of them are not available but the thing is you can still use this file because for example you might want to go back later on and, and uh, say that okay well the, the client wanted to have maybe a darker mood or a, or a lighter mood so in that case you can lower the exposure of these layers as you want you still have this flexibility uh, so what I usually do is I'm gonna set this to 16-bit or actually let me delete this just leave the main render I'm also gonna leave any cha channels I have and I'm gonna switch this to 16 bits mode and I'm gonna save this as a separate file okay so I'm gonna call this uh, 16 bit and these these ones in 32-bit mode I'm gonna save this as a 32-bit file and then I'm gonna open the 16-bit six, one okay and now from file uh, place linked I can place that 32-bit file in here click OK so now I have the same file here in this 16-bit file and I can do uh, curve adjustments to it I can do I have all the filters available you know I have all the layer blending modes available and the nice thing is that if I change for example let's say I I solo just uh, this emitter I save the file Okay, it's going to update in my 16-bit file uh, automatically and I can continue to work here so one advantage to this or another advantage is that let's say for example we want to uh, clean up this uh, this noise here that we got from the ceiling emitters uh, so first of all I can solo this layer the ceiling emitter so I can see it more clearly and I can't do I can't use the filter here uh, filter noise uh, dust and scratches which is actually a pretty nice filter to get rid of these bright little dusty spots I can't use it in 32-bit but I can't use it in 16-bit so now I'm just gonna save this file so I soloed the ceiling emitters just so I can see them uh, I can see the noise clearer I go back to my main file and it's updated and in this file since this is a smart object also the I can always go back to the filter and change the setting so I'm gonna select first the area with the lasso tool so maybe something like that 
just so you get the idea. And then I go to filter, noise, dust and scratches. Right, so you can see that works pretty well. I mean, uh, the thing with this filter is that you want to have the threshold high enough until most of the noise disappears, but you don't want to go too low because that's going to really start uh, removing stuff you don't want removed. So you can see here, if I set it too low, you can see that most of the reflections here disappear and um, the line here on the chrome disappears and we don't want that. I just want these little spots to disappear. All right, so maybe like that. You can see the difference it makes. Now, of course, also I can go in and hide this. So I can use the brush, set it to black, so I can hide the influence of this uh, dust and scratches layer where I don't want it to be visible. Here, for example. And also here you can see it makes this breaks up this line here which it shouldn't so I can brush that out in the oops in the smart filter mask and so on. And here, maybe I can double click here. I can go back to this filter and actually lower the threshold a little bit to remove more of those little spots. Something like that. So it's really nice that you can go back to the filter and always change the settings. All right, so you get the, the, the basic idea. You can always change these, these filters around. when you're working with small smart filters. And once I'm done with this, so this was the view with just the ceiling emitter uh, visible. So of course, then this noise is going to be much more visible uh, than it's, it's supposed to be when both the emitters are on. I'm just gonna save this. But now I can go back here and activate both layers again, resave the file, the 32-bit file. I go back here and it's updated, you know. So now th that that noise is blended also with the with the rest of the or the the ceiling emitters, but still that little noise reduction helped. Okay, so that's pretty nice. Uh, and also, let's say, for example, we, we just want to do a noise reduction here in the shower area. Uh, we could also duplicate this one. So that I'm going to use a different mask for the, for the noise. Let me just remove this. Ah, there we go. Okay, so for this top one, I'm going to use the, uh, let's see, I can... Mark it first. Actually, when I use the material ID, so use the magic wand, make the selection, select the top layer, filter, noise, reduce noise. So now it only affects that area. So something like that. So here I have another smart filter with a different mask. Because if I had if I had added the reduced noise to this one, it, it, they would all use the same mask. So, that, so that's why I had to copy it to another layer. Right, and again, you can go in with the brush and uh, decide exactly where this noise reduction is supposed to be and where it's not supposed to be, and things like that. So this is a really nice workflow because now you still have access to all the 32-bit. 
nice controls here of the exposure. Like for example, I can make it really bright and here you see it's blown out now, but I have a layer mask here also in 32-bit mode, so I can make a really subtle change here so it's not blown out anymore. I resave the file and once it's saved, I go back here in my main file and you see it's updated. Okay, so The next little adjustment you need to do is really always do a either a levels adjustment if you're in a hurry or if you really want to just make a nice contract contrast in your image very fast. So you can either use the levels or for more control, you can also use curves or you can use them together depending on what you what you're going for. So the levels really are a very fast a very fast way to have a nice contrast in your images. So what you're looking for is to move these little triangles to where your histogram starts really. So you can see here, I have a lot of area which is just, there isn't any information there. And that's why I have a little grayish, dull looking render. And as soon as I move this little triangle to about where the histogram starts, you can see I already improved the contrast quite a bit. You know, compared to a, your default raw render, so to speak. And, you know, this takes a few seconds and it really does a lot to your render. You know, it's a, it's a huge difference for me anyway, just this little contrast boost. And uh, then afterwards, you can also go into the curves. And usually if you want more contrast, you make a little S-shaped curve like that. You know, something like that. I usually like to keep the the black levels, like just the the end of it, really crush them a lot. It seems to make things much more photographic um, compared to leaving them too uh, too bright. You know, I, I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit here, but you get the idea. And of course, you still have the layer mask. So if it's too much on the on the sink here, you can go ahead and paint a little bit with like 10% or 20%. So it's not too blown out and things like that. You can see also where I added the uh, the curves here. It also brought out that noise a little bit more. So you can always go back to the reduce noise filter, double click on it, and you can maybe reduce this to make the, the noise reduction even heavier. Like that. Okay, and last thing I wanted to show you quickly is the difference between working in RGB mode, which is I'm, which is what I'm doing now, uh, compared to lab mode. And this has to do with when you when you change the contrast. Most of all, uh, something you should be aware of when working with RGB mode. So you can see that as I have increased uh, the contrast. Or actually, we can also do it just with the levels. Okay, so I'm squeezing these two together to increase the contrast. But you can see that it's not just the contrast that increases, it's also the saturation um, of your image. And that's very important to, to keep in mind um, when, you, when you do any contrast changes using either levels or curves in RGB, that you're also going to affect the saturation, not just the, the luminance, okay? In, uh, in RGB mode. And many times you want to sort of decouple the luminance w with the color information. And the way to do that is actually to work in, in lab mode. Okay, so lab stands for luminance, and then you have the A, B 
uh, color pairs, which is um, this is A is sort of cyan to to magenta or reddish, and blue is blue to yellow. And I'm going to show you that the difference that can make if I let me just save this one. And I can save this as 16 bits lab. So you can see the differences it makes when we're going to change contrast in lab mode. And if I now go to mode lab color, it's going to tell me that it, it has to delete these two adjustment layers because it can't really translate them over to uh, lab color. So if I click OK, it's going to delete those. And I'm going to check here, don't rasterize, because we want to keep these files linked. We don't want to embed them in our file. OK, so what happened is that it deleted just those two uh, adjustment layers. Uh, while we still have the, the same functionality with the linked 32-bit file and all that. And now if I add a curve layer, you can see now that instead of RGB, we have lightness and A and B. Okay, And so A and B is sort of cyan to magenta or, yeah, it's, let's see, violet to red, something. <laughs> and you can see here if I add, if I move this slider closer to the center, it turns more cyan. If I move the other one closer to the center, it turns more magenta red. Okay, so this is the A channel, and the second pair is blue to yellow. So if I move this closer, I'm increasing the contrast of of the blue uh, channel here. So it turns more blue, and the other one it turns more yellow. Okay, and you can see here in the in the channels, if we just see the blue channel, oops. This is what it looks like. So the, the brighter it is, the more uh, yellow is in it. And dark, the darker it is, the more uh, blue is in it. So the only thing you're doing really is that you're changing the contrast of only this relationship between blue and yellow. So this is a very nice way to saturate, to bring out saturation in your images while not affecting the lightness at all. So Let's, for example, just change the saturation. If I set this to about 90 and then move this one the same amount, so it also says 90, so we keep the same white balance. You can see now I've increased the saturation of both the blue and the yellow color components. And I can do the same for the A. Set this to 90 minus 90 and this one to 90. And now I've really just increased the saturation of the image, but you see it hasn't affected at all the the lightness or the, the contrast itself in the, in the render. It's still the same contrast really. And many times you want to do this uh, compared to just have this, uh, actually let me open the, 16-bit one. Compared to the way it works in RGB, when you're, again, you're changing both the contrast and the saturation at the same time. So in lab mode, you really have more, much better control over this. And uh, now, for example, I can change the lightness, you know, completely separate from the saturation. And actually, let me duplicate this one so you can see what it looks like just changing the lightness. So I'm going to reset these. And you can see what it looks like just changing the, the contrast really of the image without affecting at all the, the saturation. You can give a, give a pretty nice look, something which would be much more difficult to achieve in RGB mode. You know, this looks like sort of like a faded 
a faded subtle look but still pretty contrasty so I can exaggerate it even more you know compared to the 16 bit which doesn't look the same at all because it's also a lot more saturated right so that's pretty much it for this short introductory to post-production and hopefully you find it useful to keep this this workflow that you still have your 32-bit file uh, Photoshop file while you while you're working to finalize uh, you know the final touches you do them in 16-bit and then you can always go back at any point and play with the exposure of your different emitters in your scene like here I'm you can completely change the mood just save the file and then it's automatically updated in all the files where you use them right you can see also the, the limitation of RGB mode that this looks pretty fake now with so much contrast uh, compared to the lab one which looks better to me. I mean it gives you a particular mood while the RGB one looks fake so you can really push things a lot further while you're in lab mode. Uh, just keep in mind that now if you want to switch to RGB uh, you have to embed these uh, these curves so you have to flatten the image or it's going to remove the, the effect of the curves really what, what you could do is uh, for example you can take these two these four as an option uh, and you can hold down alt and go here to the layers palette and go to merge visible so if you hold down alt it's going to give you a merged version of those layers without actually deleting anything uh, in your in the rest of your uh, file and then you can switch to RGB mode click OK don't rasterize and I still have that those changes made in, in lab mode here because I, I merged the layers on top uh, and one final thing to show you is a very quick adjustment layer here which is the color lookup adjustment layer uh, so again this also only works in 16-bit mode it doesn't work in 32-bit mode and here you can apply something called a LUT or lookup table which is um, sort of a more sophisticated uh, tone mapping of your of your image that tries to mimic different looks so it changes different colors in different ways it's a bit more uh, let's say complex change in both contrast and, and saturation and hues and I really like to use for example this one the Kodak emulation one it can give a pretty photographic look and especially I like these uh, color lookup adjustment layers if you use the the Fuji ones or the Kodak ones especially for bright or highlights usually it, it makes them look just a little bit more you know punchy and 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 photographic compared to the ones from the render and that's really just a few seconds to add these adjustments if you're in a hurry and I, I usually add these uh, at the end really uh, let's write another one this one looks pretty cool too it's more like an in Instagram <laughs> filters the Fuji ones are a little bit more extreme. You can also use the arrow keys to go through them. This one is pretty nice 70s look. <laughs> of 
of course you can lower the opacity and all things like that but I usually add a, a color lookup table just to see the effect it, it makes and usually I like the effect and uh, sometimes I just lower the opacity so it's not the effect is not so strong and you know you have the, the masks and all that stuff all right so I think I talked enough for this episode uh, Matthew are you there I think you muted yourself Oh, there we go. go. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I, I did want to add, uh, I'm a big fan of lab mode in Photoshop, right. but if you don't want to go into lab mode and you, wanna, you want to apply a curve without affecting the saturation, you can change the blend mode of the curve to luminance. Oh, and, right. And then you'll avoid that. And it's only going to avoid... Uh, add affect the luminance right the contrast right mm -hmm. and in terms of color lookup table I think the the color lookup tables that come with Photoshop are, are pretty good there's a lot of them you can get elsewhere and I love a program called 3d LUT creator yeah uh, right and, I've been meaning to try that one I saw the their website looks pretty cool it really is like if you need to isolate a particular color and say I just want to make um, let's say your washcloth in that scene was pink and you decided you mm. needed it to be green mm. you're gonna isolate just that color change the color of the washcloth without any color contamination anywhere else in the sea nice nice yeah great let me write that down in the chat so 3d LUT creator. Yeah. No, sorry. I, I think I sent it just to you. <laughs> uh, 3D LUT. I can't type anymore. 3D LUT creator. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have to try that one. Yeah. And in it's fact, I've been working on trying to make a, um, a color checker chart that I can render so essentially do two renders so if you were rendering that scene i would render it once as you did and then once with this color checker chart sort of sitting on the sink just to a point where i can make out those colors clearly mm -hmm. um and then use that in the post process the same way i would use a color checker um if i had just shot the room with mm -hmm. a with a camera but you know there is a color checker object included in the install which already has the, the the appropriate RGB values. You can just put that in your in your render. I had no idea. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it's um, all right because you use just a plugin in Studio. You have the um, you have the library where you can import it. But if you look in the uh, in the install folder, let me check. Uh, library. Yes, so uh, library objects primitives, and you have a color checker MXS, so you can import that as a uh, as a reference if you want into Maya. Oh, you can use that one. Mm. Yeah, it's a it's a, sta a standard uh, Macbeth uh, chart. Perfect. One of the things I always find a little, you know, I'm always trying to make. Uh, images that to my eye look like a photograph and mm. so I also find the 6500 white balance to be a little odd to my eye sometimes um, Too much only green? because I come from film so I'm not I'm not used to seeing it that way mm -hmm. uh, I love Maxwell's uh, portrait 160 NC preset which was uh, an emulation of their neutral color. They made two portraits. They made a vivid color and a neutral color. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that response curve is, is really nice coming right out of Maxwell. They did a good job with that. 
let's see if I can find that. Uh, 160 NC, neutral color. 160. Yeah. Let's see. Oh yeah, that looks pretty. That that changed very very. I mean, it made some very subtle changes. Yeah. It's mostly the contrast without affecting too much of a color shift, yeah. or too much of a saturation shift. That's you know, if I were shooting a portrait, that's what I would use, for example. So when you look at sort of a like a Vanity Fair sort of thing, although today it's all so worked over, but back when we were just shooting a lot of film, that would be a, a very typical response curve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah, I the like one, these two. Yeah. Watch right here. Even even the 800 seems a little bit more punchy, but it's still very, very nice looking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I hope people take away from this that you should always, always do a little bit of adjustments of your renders, because I see a lot of people posting uh, great renders where they did a lot of work on the lighting and the textures and the modeling and then the final stage <laughs> uh, They they don't do it at all. They just uh, you know do a screenshot of, of Maxwell's UI. So Anyone watching this please avoid that and do a little bit of post-production because you have to do that Even if you were taking a photo of something. So I hope people I hope that's clear for people <laughs> at least after watching this right Matthew? Yes. Yes. Oh, you're there. Okay. No, it was quiet there for a second. Okay. So uh, if you want, we can switch to your screen. You can begin. Okay. So I'll make you the presenter. Let's see. Change presenter. Matthew. Yes. Okay. You should see something now appearing for you. Something about sharing your screen. Oh, okay. There we go. Do you have me now? Yeah, I see your screen. Great. Okay. I find one of the most interesting things in, in coming to this, as, as you and I were talking before, I, I am definitely not um, a season 3D artist by any stretch of the imagination. I've only started doing this a few years ago. My yeah. background. <laughs> Don't worry, nobody is going to make fun of you. <laughs> my background is photography and cinematography. And every time I look at a render I've done, when I do a new one, I think, wow, I, I, I nailed it. This is really good. Mm -hmm. And then about a month goes by, and I look back at what I had just done, and I go, oh my God, it's absolute garbage. <laughs> I should have done this. I should have done that. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I find very interesting when I look at the forums and I see work that people are doing mm -hmm. is you know, there's sort of two ways to approach everything. And one is to make something that is believably perfect. And that is what commercial photographers have been doing for years, sometimes bordering on unbelievably perfect, right, with all the retouching. Yeah. So you're not trying to make something that looks like it would exist in the real world, but an idealized version of it. Hmm. And then the other way to approach rendering is more of a VFX way, which is making something perfectly believable with stains and wrinkles and, you know, hmm. stuff that shouldn't be there. I mean, I'm looking at your vanity and I'm thinking my vanity never looks that clean. Hmm. <laughs> um, and so that's probably not necessary. It's probably not something you would think of when doing, say, an architectural rendering or a product shot. Um, and, and rendering can, I think, really has an amazing place there. I mean, I remember years ago photographing some, some very high-end watches, like $20,000 watches, hmm. with a, a very critical... A large format camera, high resolution lens. We were doing macro shots, right? So in the amount of retouching that had to be done because of the dust that was inside the watch on oh, the face right. of the watch, it took days and days and days yeah. to clean that up. <laughs> yeah. So commercial photographers spent the past 50 years trying to make their product photos basically look like a render. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. You know, so... Um, so I find it very interesting because I find creating something that looks perfect to be relatively easy, but 
that throws my eye off a lot, um, especially when I see work that is meant to be uh, more narrative in nature, which is which is how I consider mine mm -hmm. to be. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the most difficult part. I think I wrote this on the forum also to, to have a not make everything look like it was uh, found at the bottom of the ocean and <laughs> dug up, you know, uh, that's pretty easy because it just makes something really, really old. But it's very difficult to make something that's believable and that's not ma mathematically perfect either. That's that's the most difficult, really, to me. I, I, I think so, too. And and it all has to fit, you know, the story, right? So I, mm. I'm an artist and I, I create... I tend to create narrative works. So for me, everything starts with what, what story do I want to tell? Mm -hmm. And what's great about working in 3D is I'm able to create sets that I wouldn't normally be able to build. Um, I started doing this three years ago when we did an, an opera house scene, which I could probably pull up. Um, and I, I actually scouted a ton of locations to try and find the perfect opera house, but, um, America has some opera houses, but not like the ones I saw in Europe, which is what I was thinking of in my mind. Right. And then we thought about, okay, what would it cost for us to build this out? And we estimated it about $50,000. And I didn't have that. <laughs> <laughs> you mean to so, build a set in real life? To build the set in real life, yeah. Um, and and so we decided to try and do it do it virtually and then composite the people in. And so that was my first experience with mm -hmm. doing that. And in fact, I'll try and I'll try and bring that up here for a second to show you. I think yeah. I mean while I was looking at your images, you definitely have a, a specific look. It's very high contrast. Um, it's very filmic, your your images. I mean, uh, uh, let's say it's it's pretty far removed from your typical product photography, really. Uh, like you say, it's more of a s storytelling approach. And uh, that would be nice to know a little bit how you, you know, how you think about a project from the beginning, how you, what do you plan first, uh, you know, uh, how do you plan the lighting and stuff like that, and how, how do you translate it to, to 3D? Okay. Well, let's start with the, this one here, which is the... Right, this is one of my favorites, the, yeah, the Sunset Boulevard. The right. Inspired one, yeah. That was the inspiration for it. Um, and so I knew I wanted to, to, to do sort of a take on that. Um, and I, I knew I had a, an initial idea of what that would be, but I didn't want it to look, uh, you know, I watched the film and I said, well, that's not really, she's not crazy. My character. So I start with a script, whether it's the opera house scene, whether it's, um, the Midas scene, I start with with an, a notion of a scene. And I sort of jot out what that is. So in here, it's it's um, a formerly famous actress who sort of faded into memory. Um, she sacrificed everything in her life for her career and to achieve what she felt was greatness. And now it, at the end of her days, that's all she has left. You know, there's no family around, there's no friends, nobody remembers her, but she remembers herself and she remembers her, her younger days. Um, and mm -hmm. here she is just sort of looking back on this. It's just an issue I grapple with as an artist, like how much do you sacrifice for, for what you're doing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then once we had that, I started thinking, okay, where does, where does she live? And what does that look like? And what what color palette am I going to use? Right. And everything should support the narrative. I mean, if you look at a at a if you watch a movie, possible exceptions, a few from the seventies, but if you watch a movie and really any movie you see, and you you freeze frame that film, everything you see on screen 
is there for a reason. Nothing is there by accident. Mm. I remember the first film I worked on as a gaffer to light, to help light. Um, we had taken over a location and I walked into the location. I was like, oh, this is gorgeous. You know, we'll do this here. We'll do this there. Um, and then I saw the director and the art director or production designer completely remove everything from the location, paint the walls and bring all new stuff in. <laughs> And I was like, this seems like an unbelievable waste. I mean, it looked good before. But as I learned more and more, I realized that the stuff that was there didn't support this particular narrative or that particular um, color palette that the director and the art director, production designer had in mind. So I try and and think of it in those terms first. What What tells the story? So in this frame, she's sitting here. I wanted her on an old leather sort of Chesterfield kind of couch and wood paneling and wood doors and you know, darkish wallpaper, sort of an art deco thing. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show the time that she would have been around during, I guess, yeah. um, the vase, uh, the old projector. And, and I just wanted to sort of bring that, bring that together. I thought I thought those tones would set her off a bit more. Um, I like the mix of the warm light with the with the blue screen light that we have coming at her. Yeah. Uh, so, and so I just thought it would work. Yeah. Well, in in this case, for example, you decided to not light anything in the background. You know, any fill light stuff like that. Just very very focused on her, right? I mean, there's actually a lot of lights. Um, if I, if I turn on, because I didn't, for this image, I did not use, uh, an environmental image based light. Mm -hmm. So if I turn on the lights layer here, let's, let's go into the perspective view. Make this bigger. So here's sort of our set. Mm -hmm. And if I turn on the lights, those are all the lights we have. So I have one light that's just sort of giving a little boosted illumination to the ceiling. Mm -hmm. And it's pointed up or it's pointed yes, up towards pointed the ceiling? Up. Right. Okay. We go in here a little bit. We have this light just adding a kicker mm -hmm. to the base and the table. The chandelier lights are obviously glowing. I have an ambient light there in terms of that that ball in the background just to bring some light from off stage mm -hmm. same thing here i put through just another uh, just another ear area light in terms of a sphere over there to sort of lighten up that area a little bit more the picture has a the painting has a light on it another ambient light here just to sort of fill the room a bit each of these lamps are lit I have another little kicker that's going on the crystal. Yeah. I have a, a couple small little area lights hitting the projector there. Can I ask this you something? Is yes. Uh, well, uh, this is a, an older scene, I imagine, right? Before Maxwell had the, uh, the spotlight type emitter. Correct. Right. Okay. So, do do you use uh, do you tend to use the spotlight emitter more now, or I do a lot more. Sometimes I still want some larger, um, softer lights, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I'll do exactly how I would do it on a physical set. Sometimes I'll throw up a large light in terms of like as if it were a softbox, mm -hmm. and then I'll make a flag just using a black Lambert. Mm -hmm. And I'll use the flag to cut the light off a particular part of the image. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and one of the things I really like about Maxwell is that everything responds as it would in a real world studio. So if I were actually lighting this, you know, you, you can't see here anything out of frame you can't see. So I really would put a little light there. I put a little mold, maybe, you know, a mm -hmm. tweeny or something, just sort of shining a little light there. 
here out of frame in front where you couldn't see, I'd have a light up high here, kicking down a little spotlight, like mm -hmm. a little Fresnel, kicking down on the crystal there. Um, this light here, obviously I wouldn't put a big softbox there, but behind that couch, I might have a light coming up, little rim light, or off to the side on each side, rim lights coming down in this area. Mm -hmm. I wanted to throw a little light here to open up the door in that area a little bit, so I had a light here uh to camera left again i would do that in real life mm -hmm. um this light here this big ambient light that i might just position above right mm -hmm. and i guess one important question is did you do the 3d scene first and then photographed the the the, the people photographed yes it? i always i always do that and I have the luxury with what I do of being able to do that. A lot of people who are working in um, in visual effects don't get to do that, right? They have um, they have a, a footage that's already been shot, and then they have to create a background mm. for that. Um, I don't have to worry about that, so I get to do the background first, and that's especially helpful when it comes time to to shoot the talent because what i do then is from maya i take all the measurements from my camera so i have a camera that i've made if we go back here to to maya this this camera it's leaf back landscape shape so i, I shoot a, a digital medium format camera on the phase one line the back i use is made by a company called leaf uh, mm -hmm. Same as phase one, and so I've input the size of the sensor and all the particulars to that camera. So if I put virtually here, if I put a 150 millimeter lens on this virtual camera in Maya, I'll get the same exact perspective as I would in the studio with a 150 millimeter lens. Mm -hmm. So then I start taking all the information from from this camera. How high is it? So it's 198.5 centimeters off the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's rotated here. I got a down angle, 217. Um, and I, I measure that out in the studio using the same lens. And then I know that if I position someone in the frame, they're gonna comp in seamlessly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And from there, yeah, from there, the second thing that's important is, is to light them the same way they're lit in the scene. So here I measured out where these, where these lights would exist in real space. So I measured them out in virtual space and I said, okay, mm -hmm. they need to be here. So we set up a strobe on each side of the talent exactly where they would be. We gelled them so that they would be a little warmer. And then we positioned another small strobe where this projector would be, and we gelled that blue. Mm -hmm. um, so that the light hitting her, the reflections on, on the Oscar statuette there, that mm -hmm. they would be accurate to the scene. Right. And uh, of this, wh when you put everything together, what do you find the most time consuming? Because you've already measured out the lights, the colors and things like that. That to me seems pretty straightforward then in the, when you merge everything together, what usually uh, takes you time? What, what, what usually takes most time after you finish this, this process, the 3D scene and the real photos? Getting, getting the, the people and the scene to look like everything's integrated so for here which one are we on Let's see. maybe it'd be better to use this version so that's the background plate that i rendered and okay. i knew that wasn't really how i wanted it what i wanted the final look to be although i thought that would be kind of close Let's turn all this off. Okay. 
So now we bring her in. And then we start using curves adjustments to, to match the scene because she has doesn't have nearly as much contrast there as mm -hmm. she has seen. I then knew I wanted more blue light coming at her, but I didn't want to make her blue first. So first I have to make her match the scene. So that's not the color I want on her, but mm -hmm. she now integrates into the scene. And of course we add shadows for her so that she fits on that couch. Mm -hmm. Then from there, we adjust those those lights as a whole to give the blue the blue light from the screen coming at her, right? Sort of dodge her in a little bit. After that, I bring in the butler, and same thing. He's too bright, so now we got to bring him down and relight him a bit so that he fits into the scene. Even there, like the collar is a little too hot, so bring that down. Get mm -hmm. some blue light on him. Continue to bring him more into shadow. Right. Hmm. Clipping these people out takes a while. Um, and then from there, okay, his hand. Now, this was a tough one because his hand there really would, if you look at the lights here, be lit that bright. But yet it distracts from her because your your eye goes there. Mm -hmm. So even though it's accurate, it works against the narrative. But if I just tone that down a bit, even though it's not as realistic, it serves the narrative because now our eye isn't drawn away from her. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, then we add it into the projection light bunch of layers to sort of bring that about. I added in some lens flare. I wanted a little bit of volumetric lighting, which is something that I've I've struggled with in Maxwell, so I find it easier to to do it in post. Mm -hmm. The yeah. bar set again too bright, brought that down. Then I just did basically the retouching on her. Once I got that all together, then I just started working the scene. I use a set of check layers when I do this so I can remove everything other than the luminance values, uh -huh. saturation values, and, and color values. So when I come back to I'll give you an example how I use that, let's say we're back to to just her. Turn off, turn off the butler here. And we're going to turn off all the adjustments on, on her. Okay. Hmm. If we come up here, sometimes if you look at that as is, it's hard to know what adjustment to make. Yeah. But if we remove all the color information, it's very clear to see that she's much brighter than the rest of the scene. Her bright, just the, the brightness alone does not fit, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a good, uh, good workflow. So because... then by adding this curve, if we play with this curve, we can turn around and say, okay, she's still too bright. She's still too bright. Well, now she's too dark for the scene. Mm -hmm. That doesn't look normal. Yeah. But now she kind of blends into the scene correctly. Hmm. And the same can be true if you isolate saturation levels or hue levels right so and those were in uh it, it's a red color layer sorry the the saturation and the hue layers are they in a special yeah. blending mode the that you mixer, use the channel mixer is is uh you could desaturate but i find this works better 20 40 40. um and that's that's just set to normal Here we set it to hue, and it could be any solid, but I use red, just as long as it's 100% opacity set to hue. So now mm -hmm. you know if the hue is the same or not, or if it's if it fits, if it's cohesive. Mm -hmm. Then the luminosity. And then I set it to luminosity, and that gives me 
that gives me a good look at saturation. And then if I bring them together, that really gives you saturation. And then if you need to bump it just to be able to see it a little better, I, I do that. So if we threw, let's say, let's say on her, Trying to think how I could do this in a way that would demonstrate because this is already sort of built in. But if our background plate I'll throw a hue saturation on there and I'll shift the hue so that it's it's really pretty red and a little desaturated. Okay, the colors of that background, obviously, her color isn't the same. Mm -hmm. You see how this is very reddish, but she's not? Right, she's more uh, brownish, yellowish, right, from the... Right. Okay, mm -hmm. so now, if we throw a hue saturation level on her, hue saturation, let's clip that to her. Now I know we got to move it this way because I moved the other one, but let's say we didn't. Let's say it was just a, a mm -hmm. stock image that you had that you needed to match. Right. Okay. That looks a little more cohesive. So let's see what happens when we take our check layer off. Ah, look, she fits mm -hmm. in. Right, that's highlight here kind of match the highlights there. So mm -hmm. when you're bringing a real element into the shot, um, that really matters to me. Like, are the highlights in the render? Do they have the same qualities as the highlights on the people? Everything mm -hmm. sort of has to match. And what I typically do is I get an idea of the background plate. I try and get it as close to how I want it as possible. But ultimately, if I'm if I, I'm matching both, I'm matching the people to the plate and the plate to the people, but if but more weight goes to the people. If the people look good, mm. how they're photographed, um, and I know that looks photographic because it actually is a photograph, then I'll try and nudge the background plate more to mm -hmm. who the person is, how the people were shot. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's very nice info. I think we should mention to people also that the, I mean, I see that you're also concentrating, first of all, on differences in luminance, right? Because hum, humans are much more sensitive to changes in, 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 in contrast and brightness than they are to changes in, in color. So Absolutely. Right. So it's a good idea to, to first concentrate on the luminance and then go on with the, the hues and the saturation. And if something looks good in black and white, it will almost always look good mm -hmm. in color, but yeah. not the other way around. Right. So if you watch people light a TV show, for example, um, they'll have one video monitor that is just desaturated. And as they're adjusting the lighting, they'll look at that black and white image. Does that image have the contrast that, that it wants? Does it, mm -hmm. does it look good in black and white? And if it looks good in black and white, it's going to look good on the color monitor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So yes. that's pretty much what I do. When I build a model or if I buy a model and I'm going to texture it, I always kind of bring it into this sort of little virtual studio that I made um, to see how it lights in there. It's a very nice lamp model, chandelier model. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that um, looks pretty much like a photo to me if you told me that's a that's a stock photo i wouldn't have said no it's yeah it's very very nice so this is your virtual studio where you test stuff uh the test I the do. models to see that they're going to yeah, behave I bring the model and i bring it into um especially if i if it's a model i bought i normally have to do some uh i normally have to sort of redo the geometry sometimes a little bit and definitely re-uv map it and then I might bring it into ZBrush to 
uh, sort of distress certain things a little bit more or less depending. Mm -hmm. But then I always bring it into a studio like this just so I can I can move lights around and really see how the material works as a material. Mm -hmm. And that's something I started doing later in the process because when I was when I would take a scene like the one I had and I would just texture it using the plugin um, in the scene, I would think it was good, but something would sort of be gnawing at me a little bit like what? It just doesn't look really real. Mm -hmm. And I found it difficult to really isolate that within the scene as opposed to, you know, bringing it into a little studio like this, taking different shots, I guess, of it with light in different places and being able to say, you know what, that wood's just not reflecting like wood would, right? Or or the chandelier and trying to figure out different ways to uh, post-production processes that would, would also do well with this. Like I find that no matter what glass I use, and this was actually a material that was on the Maxwell Materials website called Vero Flint. Um, it never, it never looks all that great to me right off the bat, but I always make an, I make a material ID mask and an object ID mask mm -hmm. and I select the, whatever glass or crystal, especially if it's crystal is in the object ID. And then I apply a pretty strong S curve just to that. And that always really brings it out and makes it look more like crystal to me. Um, I'm also a big fan of the Simulens feature in Maxwell. Yeah, I, that's something I forgot to mention. I always add a little bit of scattering. Uh, yeah, to I the really rivers. like the, I really like the nine blade aperture map, um, and I like to use the the dust um, obstruction, I guess. Yeah, that they call. It. Um, and I put a little bit of. Uh, scattering and a little bit of what's the first control there called before the, good diffusion Stra the, uh, no diffraction, diffraction? yeah I, a little bit of diffraction and a little bit of scattering together and what I really like about it is you know there's a lot of ways to try and fake that in Photoshop but it always looks fake you can if you yeah. spend a lot of time you can make it look less fake but it's still if you really know what you're looking at, it it doesn't do what light really does, but that's the beauty of Maxwell, right? It does exactly what light really does, um, which is why it's it's so it's so great as a photographer to use that program because it's just everything works how I think it should work. Yeah, it's um, it's, it's nice to hear. Also, after after your presentation, maybe we can talk a little bit about stuff that you don't like so much and you would like to see improved, you know, both in terms of, let's say, workflow and also in terms of features. We can, can go through that as well. Sure. That's the, the couch we used. Now, the model came in. To, all right, to go back and give you an example of the workflow. So I bought this model. The, the texturing I didn't like at all. Um, and both cushions were roughly the same, but of course she was going to be sitting there, right? Mm -hmm. So I couldn't have her sitting on a cushion that looked like that. So that's for and a, a good example of why I would bring the model into ZBrush and deform it there, um, mm -hmm. so that so that she would fit into the model then. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you something about the the stage where you? Wh when you set up the the scene, the stage, because we had another uh, member on the forum before. I'm I'm very sorry, I forgot his his name now. Which was all he was also doing, um, you know, uh, virtual sets with real people, and he was actually using models of humans, virtual models from Poser or you know Das 3D, to put them in in the scene so that he could better see the the lighting, how it falls on the on the virtual people. So you can better light the the real people later. Do you do that sometimes, or yes, or I do. Much? Okay. Yes, I do. I have a, I have a couple um, analog uh, people. One is I think named Rosie. One Dennis. <laughs> okay. I don't I don't do too much with um, with Daz in terms of creating my own characters because I don't 
I only use it as an analog to give me an idea of how the light will will fall on the person. Because mm -hmm. it's not only important to, this is something to think about, it's not only important to put the lights that you have in your scene around the model, like I did using the two lamps behind the talent and the projector, but let's say you're shooting a model, I have a scene coming up we're, we're doing this with, and they're on they're on a boat so or or you're in a studio like this let's say you have a model sitting on that couch mm -hmm. and you know that you want very flattering light on her and so you're going to use a big soft box uh just above her in front of her pointed down about 45 degrees and just off to one side give her some nice rembrandt lighting say right mm -hmm. you know what i mean when i say rembrandt lighting yeah yeah it's uh, okay. right. the light from the side. If people don't know that, go <laughs> well, <laughs> go look it up. It's on Google. It's like okay. So if I don't have that light in the scene when I'm lighting the couch, but I have that lighting on her, it's not gonna gel. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you notice it, maybe you don't, but I'm gonna notice it, right? And you mm -hmm. would probably notice it. We should notice it. Mm -hmm. um, so if I know I'm gonna have that light on her then I have to put that light in the scene that I'm rendering, even though she's not in it. So that's when I'll put a, a 3D model of a, of a person. And I usually just keep it as either a Lambert or a Blinn. I'm really just looking to see where that light's going to fall. So if it, it doesn't have to be exact, exact, but as long as I look at it and I go, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Then when she's composited in, the light that's on, falling on her will also be the same light that's falling on the couch and it'll it'll blend together mm -hmm. right i understand and also i was thinking that maybe sometimes you need to produce a shadows let's say there's a there's a person walking up against the wall right and you need to have a pretty accurate shadow that's also a good opportunity to use virtual actors <laughs> so to speak right so you I, I know people who do that i have a i don't i don't know if i'm quite there yet um, what one good friend of mine does is he will, he'll take the photograph that he shoots of the individual, apply, uh, an alpha mask to it and put it on just a card, right? Mm -hmm. Um, like a plane and he'll have that plane throw shadows into the scene and he's done some really good work that way. So then he re-renders the scene, um, with that mm -hmm. with the cutout of right. the person he photographed so that the pose is correct mm -hmm. and he'll get his shadows that way um for mine you know i tend to i tend to paint my shadows in okay mm -hmm. and i was thinking about your materials how do you i mean do they look very complicated or would you say that right now you're not too too familiar with the material editor or what is it that you find confusing about it? Uh, things like that. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> or everything I, is confusing. I, I finally got a bit of a handle on it. I mean, I, my materials are probably more complicated than they have to be. I keep reading mm -hmm. that you should use as few layers as possible and as few, um, uh, components within each layer as possible, but I use a lot of them mm -hmm. um, because I, I tend to think in terms of uh, how a material is actually made, right? So here you'll have on this couch, you have sometimes I might paint that in where you see the dark leather and the, the other leather. Um, but more often than not now, I would make two different leathers and blend them with masks. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is I want the roughness of the scratches to be different than the roughness of the leather that isn't scratched. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, I want everything to be, I want every variable to be masked. So I don't, I don't ever set a uniform roughness, right? If I'm, if I'm setting the roughness, then there's a mask driving that even if it's very subtle right if so from there i have i make the the main material i put whatever sheen or gloss is going to go on there and then i always put dust or scratches mm -hmm. i try to make it not 
believably perfect, but perfectly believable. So I tried, I try to create flaws in everything I do, which is, is kind of weird because as we were talking about as a commercial photographer, you, you, you spend mm -hmm. your whole life trying to make things perfect and remove flaws. So mm -hmm. I spent the first half of my life trying to get rid of every imaginable flaw. And now I'm spending the second half of my life trying to introduce as many subtle little flaws as possible. Yep, yep. It never ends. Uh, so <laughs> it's ironic. Really. I, I, I started using Substance recently, um, both Substance Designer and Substance Painter. Mm -hmm. And I really, really love them, it, especially just for the masks that they can produce fairly quickly mm -hmm. instead of using something like Mari or that to, to go in and you know, paint dirt into every little crevice. Um, substance can really do that well. I, I do have some difficulty integrating it into into Maxwell a bit. And I've been on forums with that and people are like, what are you talking about? It's just, it's just you just plug the stuff in. And uh, it hasn't yeah. been that simple. I'm going to have to do a, a video about that too. I, I, I guess I'll... I'll uh talk to you later on about this to see what you think of my approach. Okay. So something missing. Everything, everything I've seen of yours is fantastic. If people don't know this, like I struggled for about six months trying to really learn how to do uh, subsurface scattering and thin materials, good lampshades, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I bought your, the the tutorials you had on Maxwell Zone there, and in like four hours I was up and running. Great. Um, <laughs> I spent I spent literally a week trying to figure out how to make a decent Maxwell carpeting out of grass using the grass extension. Hmm. If if I had seen if your Maxwell Zone had had if you had done last the last episode before that, it, I, you would have saved a week of my time. Well. So, the more, the more you're willing to put out there, the better, because that's probably my biggest. Yeah, it's. Uh, I've been wanting to do this for a long time, and now I had I, I had a little bit of time to to start doing this, and I, I love you know talking to users like this informally and and see what their opinion is because you know we don't usually just want to hear uh, oh Maxwell's great, it's everything's perfect. We also want to see how it can be improved. And I am also going to start redoing the, the documentation a bit because I know it's exactly like you said, it doesn't have enough examples. It's just like very dry and very academic. <laughs> it's supposed to be the exact opposite of that using Maxwell. I, I think there's two approaches. I, I've been talking to, since I got involved in this, I've been talking to a lot of people who do uh, 3D rendering, right? And they tend to fall into two groups. Um, mm -hmm. Highly technical, computer savvy, individuals who who understand all the nuts and bolts of how all this works hmm. and artists who don't really know much about how the stuff works in the background but they're really good at painting or lighting or something along those lines mm -hmm. and so i fall into that second category i think and the, reading the technical documentation that maxwell have it doesn't really get me there sometimes but if i can watch what you're doing then i go Oh, oh, okay. I get. I got it. I get this. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 It's something definitely to be improved. But it's nice to hear that these uh, Maxwell TV episodes are are helping people out. Sometimes I think maybe they're a bit too simple. But well, uh, <laughs> you have to start somewhere. And I guess it's I better tackling the simple things. Start. Yeah. And I would um, love to see, um, you know, people producing some more uh scenes in maxwell you know i see a lot of um i made this coffee maker right mm. or you know here's a car i textured or an axe or something like that right. but i would love to see people's approach to you know full scenes uh a little bit more oh especially because i think maxwell is really well suited to to doing that. There's a bunch of people that I've, I've recommended the program to who like me are coming to it as photographers or that. And basically what I tell them is, you know, in certain respects, it's difficult to use, but in other respects, it's real simple because everything you already know works. If you know what an F stop, if you know how to manipulate exposure and depth of field between your, you know, mm -hmm. your 
triangle of ISO exposure and shutter speed. If, you, if you've spent the past 20 years doing that with a camera, then it's going to take you two seconds to do that in Maxwell. It's very easy. Mm. And you're going to get the result that you think you, or, or that you can count on, which is why I emulated my camera in Maya. So I get the same exact depth of field with my camera that I do rendering in Maxwell. So again, things just go, things merge together very easily because you're getting the anticipated result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's good to hear. <laughs> and we'll try to take care of all this confusing stuff because I agree it's uh, the documentation is uh, has to have a lot more examples in it. Yeah. And it, it's one of the things I, I have to do now besides trying to, to find out also what, what people would like to see in future updates. Uh, Do we still have time. anybody here? Does anybody have any questions? or? Well, let me see. I can unmute people. Yeah, there are still... Yeah. Hello? Hmm? Hi, Karsten here. Hi, Karsten. Such a moment. <laughs> Such a moment. I guess you have more than one people talking right now, right? So yeah. Let's see if anybody wants to ask a question. I can, I can, uh, I can just leave you. Carson, can you still hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Hi guys. Again. All right. Um, uh, very impressive. First of all, thank you so much again to both of you. Um, my question would be, since I'm also starting to uh, get myself into um, substance painter and substance designer, um, I kind of have trouble also getting the stuff I do in, in substance designer into Maxwell to, to, look, uh, to have them look the same, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, I also have a lot of problems still uh, UVing all my, my stuff. So um, I also wrote that in that little uh, questionnaire box. How do you UV uh, your bot uh, 3D models, for example? What do you use? What, do you, what are your it tips? Yeah, it depends on how I'm going to, to texture them. Um, if I'm if I'm doing it in a in a traditional way, which for me means using photographic uh, references and sort of painting those textures or or creating a material based on those textures, um, obviously having really really accurate and useful um, UV maps is critical. And so then I just break the the models apart into as many components as I can. Um, and just do my best to UV them in Maya. Uh, okay. Uh, I ZBrush, if you use that at all, has a great tool called UV Master, and that produces. Sometimes it's a pain and it doesn't work too well, but when it works, it really works, and gives you a great UV to to work from. All right. One of, one of the really nice things about Substance is. You don't need a good UV. You just need a UV. So, for example, let's say you have a, a complex object, and I don't know what software package you use, but I use Maya. So if I use a, a create automatic UV, um, it would be horrible if you were trying to use a traditional procedural texture. Right. But if you bring that into substance and you paint in substance, it translates flawlessly. It's oh, kind of like okay. P-Tex. So in, in substance, I wouldn't worry too much about creating a perfect UV if you're going to be working in there, just making sure you get a good usable UV. All right. That uh, sounds good. I mean, I do mainly uh, do um, uh, renders for, for companies like Bosch and Siemens and then Volkswagen. So, so most of the stuff I do actually have to UV is metals or, or plastics or stuff like that. So nothing really fancy. But I, I ran into a few problems uh, with another customer who wants me to render um, some fabric, some some uh, seating and stuff like that in detail. And oh boy, <laughs> yeah. Well, 
I can yeah. I can give you a tip. There's an app I've used a long time just for UV mapping, and I found it really great, especially for these meshes you get from CAD apps, which can be really messed up. You know, you have all those little triangles and stuff. It's called Unfold 3D. Uh, uh, yeah. I've been looking now at their page, and they also seem to have a special version now for industrial designers with some special tools for that. Uh, let me write oh, okay. it down, the name of it. Oh. Yeah, that would be nice. I remember that. Um, I, I think I used it a couple of years back, but um, I forgot about it, basically. I mean, nope. usually I don't have any, I don't have too many problems, but sometimes, you know, when you go, oh man, this, this really gets tricky now. And then uh, that's why I looked into uh, Substance Painter and uh, was hoping to, to kind of work my way around there. So, yeah. What I'm really looking forward to trying out and seeing if I can get it to work with Maxwell is their new substance source, which apparently is similar to um, like V-Ray's scans that Chaos yeah. Group puts out and some others. Um, but what I like about substance, first off, I'm not a huge V-Ray fan, so right there. Same here. <laughs> I have no interest in, in going that route. But the substance one seems to be uh, infinitely adjustable. Yeah. So uh, what, actually, what I don't know is what kind of UV you would need for that, right? I don't know how substance is going to handle that. But um, they have some fabrics that I haven't played with, but they look they look like they're really good. So yeah, I used one of them uh, because of that problem I had. So I was looking for a fabric. In a, in a procedural manner, so so I could put it on a on a, a real big size wall, and uh, my normal texturing was always giving me those texture markings, you know, um, and so I I used the substance source uh, texture and it worked flawlessly. It was perfect. It was That's fantastic. Really That's good to well hear. Done. You don't yeah, have so any problems. Do you have any problems tra getting the the same look. I always find that, um, like, I don't know if it's the gamma is off a little bit or something, and and the maps tend to be softer a little bit. Yeah, a bit off uh, and a bit softer. I think I'm I'm still struggling with that too. So um, you mean softer? I'm, I'm really one, softer uh, one used in Maxwell. You mean? Yes. Yes. I mean, I, I crank it up, but it, it just doesn't look right. I, I haven't pinpointed it down yet uh, either, but again, um, I'm starting with Substance and Substance Painter and all these kind of things. And so, so I'm, I'm really looking forward for you doing a, a, a webinar on Substance to Maxwell or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so, that's two of us. I, yeah. did, I, did a, I did a whole post on the forums of, I did a mole uh, a Mole Richardson Fresnel lamp, and uh, I got it to translate fairly well with some work. I, I guess the biggest frustration for me, and I don't know if you feel this way now that you're using it, is again, I'd go onto the forums or that, and everybody would be like, I don't know what you're talking about, just plug it yeah, in. So and I'm, yeah, and I'm like, how am I, how are you not seeing what I'm seeing, or is yeah. there something wrong with me? <laughs> well, <laughs> Same here, same here. I go, I don't get it. Don't you see that? It's not working, guys. And and they say, oh, it's so simple. You just put that here and put that there, and then you, you're you done. And I go, no. <laughs> right. I don't get it. Well, we have to get to the bottom of exactly what it is yeah. you, you guys are looking for. So before I make that video, I have to post stuff on the forum. Uh, and yeah, even better, okay. it would be if you can send me some materials, some substance, uh, what do you call them? Substances, I guess. <laughs> um, um, that you have problems with and give me yeah. a little bit of an idea of what you're looking for so I can see maybe uh, what kind of formula needs to be made because ideally I would like to you, you create your stuff in substance and then you press a button and uh, it takes those bitmaps because in the end we have to use bitmaps right it gets those bitmaps and plugs them into a, a nice maximal material it gives you yeah that would be a godsend yeah, oh, yeah. it would be perfect i mean uh and i was thinking there are basically three types of materials you know you have your glass you have 
plastic and then you have metal and then well a fourth one which is metal painted and that paint would also be sort of like a plastic so i i have to really understand what you guys are having the most trouble with to see that yeah. you know to make a video that's worthwhile that answers your 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 questions i think if you just if you just do an iray render in substance you know bring the model in use the same model use the same environmental lighting mm -hmm. right and then do the render in maxwell and just see what's different i mean that to me is that one of the things i think that'll be hard in doing a trans a direct translation is you know most renderers it seems to me and i'm new to this so maybe i'm wrong but the ones i've played with at least they they differentiate between metalness and roughness right yeah so they have a metalness uh, map but really that map is usually just a black and white uh, map because you can't have like 50 percent metal and 50 percent let's say paper right those but materials it, but, don't, don't exist right but let's say you're in you're using arnold mm -hmm. if you if you take a if you're if you say that something is a dialectic shader and you make it smoother you'll get basically glossy plastic right right mm -hmm. um the metalness control determines if you're getting glossy plastic or if you're getting metal um in maxwell we have to break that into two different things yeah and and so that might be a little a little difficult to so something that you think would be two layers to translate it from from substance to maxwell becomes a minimum of three because if you have like i did with my mole light uh painted painted metal over bare metal where the paint's been chipped away mm -hmm. um you have the metal underneath you have the painted metal on top and then you have the the metallic mask that's generated out of out of substance to drive the difference between the two and then of course you have a glossy layer on top which is also masked away from the metal the mm -hmm. biggest thing i come up with is that mask never seems to translate correctly i have to futz with that a lot the glossy map or the metalness map the metalness map but that that metalness map shouldn't it be mostly completely either black and white i mean there's no gray values in it right there are gray values when you are distressing an object so if i have if i have a metal box and i want it to look like i've painted it red and dragged it behind a car say okay or it's just old some of the paints gotten thin in some places it's chipped away in other places mm -hmm. yeah. now you have gray and okay. i find i have to reduce the contrast a great deal clamp the values on each end and it takes me a long time to dial in the mask right whereas if i use arnold i really can just plug all the values in and and get it to be exactly like ira but it doesn't look as good as maxwell looks right so yeah that's, I, I, that's... I think i guess the the biggest differences will be in metals because they're really like special materials and uh, the metals in maxwell if you put the nd and the k values uh appropriate they will they will be very accurate the problem is that there will be very like perfect metals very pure perfect metals and uh maybe most of the times even if it's supposed to be a little chipped away or it's supposed to have a thin layer of paint on top it's still going to be too metal like right too bright maybe is that maybe it the is issue something, I've done. Mm -hmm. something i've experimented with is creating the metal in substance exporting the color map creating the real metal in maxwell using maxwell's system to create the metal with the nd and k value mm -hmm. and then applying the color map 
and then sometimes slightly tweaking or slightly adjusting the NDK values so that it, it works with that. And that tends to give me a pretty decent result. Sometimes I have to map the roughness there a little bit as well. But, mm -hmm. you know, because let's say it's, let's say the metal's just, let's say it's iron that's been stained over time, right? Yeah. It's still iron. So you still want the same base Maxwell metal because that's going to look better than any other metal. And then you just have to figure out how to apply the slightly different color and maybe a little bit different roughness to it. Mm -hmm. But the base values, the ND and K values, they shouldn't really change all that much, should they? I don't know. No, they shouldn't change. It's just that if you have a more worn metal, then you have to mimic this oxidation a little bit. So the metal looks a little bit fa more faded, you know? And I guess this is a little bit the most difficult part to do, um, to not make these metals look like they're completely new, completely pure metals. There's a bit right. of a bit of slight rust. Well, not rust in the sense that you see it red, but there's a little bit of this oxidation of, of fading, right? And I guess yeah. that's that's the most difficult thing to do. But I'd really like to see if you can if you can send me via email that that uh, material you you were doing with the um, with the projector. I will. Uh, and here you can even see if you look at the screen. I mean, all yeah. of that was mostly textured in substance. Mm -hmm. So. How to like the plywood? I did that exactly as I would do actual plywood. I have a I have a a, a wood layer up underneath is my base layer, mm -hmm. and then I put a, a paint layer on top of that black paint. I masked that out using grunge maps, mm -hmm. and then on top of that, you can't really see it too much, but I have I have some white whitish grayish footprints and handprints and dust and that so i layer my materials up as as they i would, would be see them in the real world, the real world. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's that's and what i do the, as well I find that you know what makes sense you tend to remember the things the things that are logical i i know how to make that if i were building a a, a physical set so yeah. i approach everything that way okay i get i go to the I go to the store and I get some shiny new metal and I make a stage, but I want that stage to look old. So what do I do? And I get some black spray paint and I grunge it up and I throw some dirt on it and I, you know, yeah. So, yeah. so I do that in the virtual environment then. Yeah. Well, it it would be great if I, I mean, before I do this substance video, if I understand exactly uh, what the problems are, which areas uh, you find the translation the most difficult. You know, okay. so it would be great if you can if if you can send me those files and I can get started to to make some sort of I don't know like a procedure for <laughs> a protocol for converting substance designer materials to Maxwell in the best way possible. I will. And then I'll I'll talk to the developers and see if we can automate it as much as possible because we already have the Python the Maxwell Python SDK and I think it's not going to be that difficult really. That would be, that would just be a light year. That would be mm -hmm. unbelievable to be able to do that. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's these f features I'm trying to convince them to to bring out more often. Features that are not so difficult to do to code, but with, which would make people's lives a lot a lot <laughs> easier. You and know, I mean, everybody, I. I, I Sub, the substance workflow, I remember when it was, well, you're just going to use it for games and that. The guys I was telling you, my friends that run the virtual effects houses that we were talking about before, they're now adopting it because it can now render out in 8K. Hmm. It uses UDIMs. So it it really is just such a, a phenomenal workflow that if you can get that integrated directly into Maxwell, I, hmm. I think that would be amazing. Yeah, me too. Me too. I mean, I, I've seen how popular it's become. And uh, uh, before it was, you know, people were, ah, no, procedural textures, that's no good. But you can use it for so much more. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Well, we spent almost two hours. Time flies. <laughs> wow. Uh, 
Carson had to pick up his son, he says. Okay. Well, Matthew, really, I want to thank you to for for taking the time and doing this show. I mean, I learned a lot, and I'm sure people learned a lot as well. To to have a little view of how you how you work, how you approach something, uh, and maybe you can come back for a later episode. You can. Uh, <laughs> When you have substance designer working, you can say, look, all these nice materials I created. That would be <laughs> fantastic. Can... <laughs> or if you have any other projects you want to share at a future date with okay. us. Right. Uh, so I'm going to post this once it's uploaded. I'm going to post this as usual on the YouTube channels and all that. And... Uh, so Matthew, please get in touch with me, or you can also post on the forum uh, stuff that you find, you know, really annoying and you would like to see improved. Because really, that okay. that kind of feedback is really good to have. I'm trying to push the developers to to <laughs> to how to say it to to also take the time and do these smaller features, but which are really useful for people. So don't hesitate to to let me know or post on the forum. Thank right? you. I will. All right. Well, let's call it a day then. Uh, actually, what time is it? Are you, it's pretty early, isn't it? Or you're in New York, sorry. I'm in New York, so for me it's 3 in okay. the afternoon. Oh, it's not that bad. I thought, I thought you were in L.A., you know, automatically. You think people in TV and film, they're in L.A., but no. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so it's not too bad a time. Well, thanks again, really, for attending, and uh, we'll see you on the forums. Sounds good. Talk later. Bye.